almost totally destroyed this car on Friday in qualifying. Coming out past the Castrol sand trap, got a sideways slam across the racetrack into the wall. Sad, and I really haven't sat back and thought about it yet, but uh, I guess the only positive aspect is looking forward to a fancy, uh, you know, really good 88 with those little BMs. Hi, Tim from Super 100. Going back through the old tapes that we've had here, there was one which reminded me of that old saying, never judge a book by its cover. I've got a real gem of a race, and it's real history here. This is the 1987 Adelaide GP support event called the South Pacific Touring Car Championship Round 1. Nobody knows where Round 2 was. It was a time where a lot of politics got involved in the sport, uh, probably a hangover from the changeover to the Group A from the old Group C days uh, from 85 and this is 87. And there's a great interview we've included in here of uh, Peter Brock. This is the last time he ever drove a Commodore in Australia before he moved on to the M3. You could feel that there was a lot of tension in the air. And look, as I say, this raises a gem because I didn't think after all these years we've had the tape that we had the whole race. Turns out we did, and it's really special. Well, undoubtedly the most popular man in Australian touring car racing, if not motor racing, Peter Brock. So, I mean, sensational news this morning. <laughs> You've won Bathurst. <laughs> no, I uh, look in life sometimes, you know, it's pretty tough. We've just got to accept the umpire's decision, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> now, it wasn't on the fuel problem. It was to do with the bodywork or the structure of the, the other cars. Yeah, it was... Uh, to be try and explain it in a, in a yeah. non-technical way, uh, they were protested against having their fenders raised and yeah. that meant they could lower the car and fit fat tyres under it and that makes a lot of difference to the speed of any car and uh, they said we don't like that so uh, Egenberg has appealed against it which is quite yeah. normal but uh, I sort of don't like his chances really. Alright so it's nine wins at Bathurst, let's come back to here now, is this the last race for the, for the Commodore, for the Brock yeah. Commodore? Looks like it doesn't it? Sad. Yeah, the boys will be having a couple of beers tonight I can assure you but I suppose you look at it and say, well, it is sad, and I really haven't sat back and thought about it yet, but uh, I guess the only positive aspect is looking forward to a fancy, uh, you know, really good 88 with those little BMs. All right, and the team has been sold? No, it hasn't. As a matter of fact, uh, if any uh, viewers out there would uh, like to buy one going concern, HTT Racing, uh, magnificent track record, <laughs> bring us up. OK, give them plenty today. It'd be nice to see you go out in the wind. Thanks. It'd be fantastic. I'll, I'll be going for it, I can tell you that. Yes, congratulations to Peter Brock. I thought 12 meter yacht racing was uh, rather peculiar, Ian, with all the protests and appeals afterwards. Here's a man that's won a, uh, Australia's major uh, touring car race six weeks after the event. Yes, at least the, uh, the protests in 12 meter uh, racing, 12 meter yacht racing, they get those over and done with at least the next day, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it must be a tough way to win a race, but uh, more so a tough way to lose one when you're told uh, six weeks later that you didn't win anyway. Well, they might not have lost. They can still appeal. They, in another six weeks' time, they might have won. The Eggenbergers might have won it again. It could be part of the Bison. It could be a Bicentennial <laughs> project, project. The, the continuing saga of Bathurst. Welcome back to Adelaide. As you can see, they're down there on the grid getting ready for the warm-up lap in the South Pacific Touring Car Championship Round 1. And uh, on the grid to have a chat to the drivers, Darrell Eastlake and uh, Pat Lindsay. Well, the Ford Sierras in this country weren't having a great run until Andrew Mayadecki got hold of one with the Oxa who had colours on it. Andy, you've had a great year. Bathurst was unlucky, but you were, you were there. Yeah, I think it was uh, very encouraging for us and the, the whole team that we could actually run with those guys. And uh, now we've got to do is get our organisation together and I'm sure we'll be, uh, you know, we'll be looking pretty good next year. Why is Johnson having so much trouble with his car, yet you uh, seem to be having a, a trouble-free run? Well, I'm not really sure, but... I think Dick's uh, doing a fair bit of his own development and that's pretty costly uh, in time and money and uh, in reliability. We uh, buy our technology from overseas where they've been doing it for a lot longer than we have and we're having a fairly good, fairly good run of success with it. Well this circuit, a street circuit, you're starting in a good position, can you win this one? Yeah I think we can, you know, providing that we transmissions are a little bit on the suspect side, we've got stronger transmissions coming next year, but providing um, 
you know, we uh, don't have any problem that way, I think we'll be looking pretty good for the race. The car's very easy on tyres and it handles very well. First corner's always a bit dodgy here. Yeah, I think we'll just have to make a go. <laughs> go like Bagger and see what happens. OK, have a good one. Thank you. Patrick Lenzi. Thanks very much, Daryl. I've got Larry Perkins on pole position. Larry, an inspirational sort of a, a crowd here in extraordinary conditions. Does that help you? Does it uh, inspire you? Well, actually, unfortunately, it doesn't, but it, I can assure you it doesn't do me any harm. It's uh, absolutely excellent to be here in uh, this support role to the, to the best you've got in the world, you know, the uh, Formula One cars. And uh, perfect day, and I've got, you know, uh, my Commodore absolutely fine, or, or my team, as I should say, and... Uh, yeah, we're pleased to be on the pole position and uh, you know, I'll be even more pleased if we pull it off though, I can assure you. Andrew, my deck is very confident. How confident are you? Well, uh, if confidence actually helped me win the race, I'd be more confident than him. But uh, I'm a realist and uh, we know we've done our preparation well. Uh, you know, I reckon I can steer it around or I hope I can. And uh, that's what you need to win races and uh, all the will in the world won't alter that. Great. Good luck. Over to you now, Daryl. Well, Glenn Seaton, you might be one of the youngest, but one of the fastest. It's an old car, but once again, you've qualified it right up the head of the grid. That's right. The car went fairly well in qualifying yesterday. So I was very surprised too. Um, we sort of done our qualifying time on second-hand tyres. And it's going to be a very long race today, very hot today. And um, I think it's whoever's going to survive is going to finish well. Is this little car suited to the street circuit here with a, with a tight boundaries and concrete walls? Yeah, it's very good. It's sort of, the cars are no good on high-speed corners and things like that but around the street circuit they get out of these tight corners very well and that's what suits this car what have you got to do to defeat the sierras and the commodores i mean what's your tactic in a race of this length in this heat well we're going to go flat out from the word go um it's we're going to treat it as a sprint race even though it is a fair fair distance even in this heat but um that's about all we can do with a car like this with no power fair to say this is the car's last race yeah, this is definitely the last race, and I'll be glad to see a new car next year. OK, good luck today. Thank you. Our commentators now, uh, Murray Walker and Alan Moffat. And Murray, uh, this should certainly be quite, quite useful around that first corner this afternoon. Yes, and what a great day it is for Australia. Wayne Gardner here today as Australia's world champion in motorcycle racing and nine times winner at Bathurst, Peter Brock, going for a win here in the South Pacific Touring Car Championship in his last drive for Holden before taking up the cudgels on behalf of BMW. Here they come. Alan Moffat, you're the man. Who is going to win? Well, I wouldn't like to uh, throw $10 on the table right away, Murray. I'm not going to fall for that. You're, you're too astute in that department. But certainly any, any one of these five cars on the front is going to have an excellent chance. Very warm today, so the turbos are not going to be at their total efficiency that they have been on, on colder days. The Commodores are strong here, and as such can be driven hard. Alan Grice showed us last year with his win that you could bounce it from curb to curb and still come home. They are very strong cars, and as such can handle the bumps. I don't think the smaller cars can do that as effectively. Larry Perkins in the Holden Commodore. Andy Maidecker in the Sierra Cosworth. Glenn Seaton there in the Nissan Skyline. Colin Bond in an Alfa Romeo. Four different makes and types of car in the first four places on the grid. Then the famous Dick Johnson, fifth on the grid, ahead of Alan Grice. Seventh, George Fury, and in eighth position, the man we will all be watching with a special interest, Peter Brock. But in pole position, what I think of now as the veteran, although he's only 37 years old, heaven knows, Larry Perkins, the studious-looking man in his rimless glasses going for it, from pole position in that tough, strong Holden Commodore. Will he be able to stave off Andy Maidecker in the Sierra Cosworth? A smaller, perhaps nimbler car, which will suit well this Adelaide circuit, as will Glenn Seaton's two-litre Nissan Skyline. Colin Bond well up in the turbocharged Alfa Romeo, ahead of Dick Johnson's Sierra. Down there, Alan Grice in the Commodore. So, two Commodores in the top six. It's a long, gruelling race, 32 laps. That's nearly 121 kilometres. And it's going to be a very hot, tired, perspiring selection of drivers that finish this race, which is going to be starting very shortly. Watch for the red. There it is. Watch for the green. There it is. It is go. Perkins gets away beautifully. Colin Bond streaks through into second place ahead of Glenn Seaton. 
by Decker dropped back. It is Perkins leading, Bond up into second place, Seaton in third as they go through the S's. They're bouncing and bumping off the curbs from the S's. They go through into that series of right and left, right angle turns, Wakefield turn, East Terrace bend, Flinders bend, then onto Market's turn. And it's still Larry Perkins with the advantage of a clear track in front of him. Bond is second, Seaton is third. There they go, there are the Sierras streaking through. And there is 4.9 litres of V8 power in the front as for the first lap in this 32 lap race. Larry Perkins sets his car up for the run down towards Brewery Bend, Brabham Straight, and then on to racetrack hairpin, and Glenn Seaton is trying to take second place from Colin Bond. But already, it seems to me, Alan, Larry is building up a bit of a lead. Colin Bond is holding him up. Yes, no? Yes, he is, but uh, to his credit, Perkins got a fabulous start. Bedecki lost the start, turbo lag, and... Uh, Really, this new Casio Commodore has got every chance of opening up an opportunity here on the first few laps with no one in front of him to bother him but fresh air. Here they come towards the end of the first lap. Out of the Victoria hairpin, the right-hander on the race course, which they are approaching now with Larry Perkins leading. Glenn Seaton is now second. Colin Bond is in third position. So it is the Holden leading, the Nissan in second, Alfa Romeo in third place, but for how much longer? Because it looked to me as though he was about to lose that third place, Colin Bond. But across the line leads Perkins. Seaton is second, up into third goes Brock. Peter Brock is in third position from eighth on the grid on the first lap. What an absolutely sensational first lap for Peter Brock in the famous number five, and this is the last time he will be driving five in the Holden. There he is. Well, Alan, would you have expected that? No, I wouldn't, but I think it was the very poor start of the other cars ahead of him. Uh, the Commodores are renowned for getting their power down on the track a little bit heavier. Well, not a little bit, the heaviest cars in the field. And as such, they can transmit that power and get the maximum grip from their tires. But that's an excellent start for Peter in, uh, from a grip position of eight position. And now look at the nimble Nissan of number 15, Glenn Seaton. Is he going to be able to stave off the power of Peter Brock's Holden? Not on this straight. And I think, well, he's doing not a bad job. They're not quite onto the straight. Here he comes slipstreaming this, the skyline. And I think it'll only be a matter of seconds he'll pull out and flatten that 440-odd horsepower coming out of that Holden Commodore. And let's watch for it now. Holden leads. Is it Holden second? Yes, it is. From eighth on the grid to second on the second lap goes Peter Brock. The only man he's got ahead of him now is Larry Perkins in a similar motor car. Holden Commodore's first and second. Nissan Skyline in third position. And Colin Bond in the Alfa Romeo is dropping back. Glenn Seaton is holding on. The first three are out on their own. And Peter Brock has certainly got a massive charge of adrenaline. Yes, and he's going to charge here. He's going to close up. He has closed up on Perkins through the hairpin. And it could be down through the chicane on this uh, next lap. He'll have a chance of even getting a closer look at the back of that Commodore in front of him. Seven tenths of a second between and. Larry Perkins and Peter Brock there, number five. 11 lead, five seconds, 15 Glenn Seaton in second place. But won't there be a cheer from Australia if Peter Brock gets into that lead position, notwithstanding the fact that he would be taking Larry Perkins in the process? Well, and closing. Perkins, of course, has got Brock really big in his mirror now. <laughs> Absolutely, he'll be looking like a praying mantis. Uh, Brock's close enough to be in the slipstream, and when they get on to Brabham Straight, he'll certainly be able to sneak right up onto the bumper bar of that car in front of him and nail him uh, midway or to perhaps under brakes at the end of the straight, but he's definitely in the slipstream. Alan, Peter Brock can't see anything of the track ahead of him at all. Is he just driving on the boot lid of Larry Perkins and following it? Well, he knows he's got a great driver in front of him. He doesn't have to worry about where Perkins is placing it, and he can literally chase that boot around of that Casio Commodore and uh, wait for an opportunity, which I think he's starting to think about right now. Yep, this looks like it. Peter Brock going for it, but Larry Perkins having none of it. Larry Perkins, of course, who has driven for Brabham in Grand Prix racing, drove in 11 Grand Prix in his distinguished career. European Formula 3 champion. 
champion of 1975. Matter of fact, I think he was 14 Grand Prix he drove in, but anyway, never mind that at the moment. It's what's happening here at Adelaide that matters, and we're on lap three, which is one eleventh distance just over in this 32 lap race, and Glenn Seaton is holding on. So it's Holden leading, Holden second, Nissan third, and Brock now with Glenn Seaton, and definitely Larry Perkins is holding him up because look how Glenn Seaton. And what about that? Well, Perkins is driving defensively, and there's no prizes for saying after me, you're first, Peter. Uh, he's doing what he should do. He's got the lead car. It's his corner, and it's up to Brocky to get by on under merits. They call this touring car racing. If this is touring, then I am a Dutchman. And Glenn Seaton is holding on magnificently when you think that his car has got a smaller engine capacity, and now Brock Seaton in third position chasing Larry Perkins nothing in it lap four 32 lap race and the crowd understandably is a goal but just let's keep you in the picture by telling you that Andrew Maidecki is in fourth position in fifth position it is Dick Johnson Sierra and in sixth place it is George Fury but this is the battle Seaton has just pulled out of the slipstream and is obviously getting a bit hot there. He's got a turbocharged car which gets hot enough upwards of a thousand degrees under that bonnet by itself and he doesn't want to lose the cold air. He's pulled out again, not something that the Holdens are fooling around yeah, with. Yeah, but look behind them. Look at the Sierras of my Decky and Dick Johnson, the two red cars. As once again, Brock gets his nose right up alongside Larry Perkins. This is lap four. But Perkins has got the inside line which he's perfectly entitled to hold, and he does so, and I dare say he would hold it even if he wasn't entitled to, because Perkins leads Brock second, Seaton third, Maidecki is in fourth position, and Dick Johnson is in fifth place, still ahead of the Nissan skyline of George Fury. Well, if these Holden drivers keep this pace up, they're not going to have tyres left for another 10 laps, Murray, and you'll find that the Sierras will come up ever so slowly. Glenn Seaton's got a great position there. He's saving his engine, just lulling along, taking advantage of the slipstream of two big cars in front of him. And uh, he's waiting for his opportunity as the tires get extra hot on the Commodores, which they have to be at this pace that they're moving. He doesn't want to do too much curb hopping like that. But in the meantime, look, my decky in the Red Sierra in the background is closing up. But is his transmission going to go the distance? Well, we, we know what it's like to lose transmissions in these Ford cars at the moment, Murray. And uh, we could almost say we're experts at it they are fragile but certainly the two red cars in the background running fourth and fifth are having their own scrap they're trying to stay in their own slipstream dick johnson hanging on with all fury there so that he doesn't lose the opportunity to stay with medecki on the straights they don't want to lose that advantage and on the straights the holders and everybody else in the front are doing some 140 miles an hour glenn seaton comes up alongside peter brock looking for the inside just showing Peter Brock by moving out of his mirror that he's going for a passing move, but that's not going to fool a veteran like Peter. But if Peter stays right behind Larry Perkins, as he is doing, and Perkins slows just even a fraction, Glenn Seaton could go through. What Seaton is doing, of course, is looking for the cool air to keep that turbo of his at a lower temperature. But now, on lap five, out of 32, with a searing contest at the front. Larry Perkins, who started from pole, still leads in the Holden Commodore from Peter Brock, who has come up from eighth to second. In the process, he passed Glenn Seaton in the Nissan Skyline, who started third. In fourth position, it's Andy Maidecker in the Ford Sierra, immediately followed by Dick Johnson, fifth. And in sixth position now, it's Alan Grice. So, Commodores are first, second, and sixth. Not bad for an end-of-season vehicle that everybody said uh, should be put out to uh, pasture. Uh, Perkins has his car handling extremely well, and actually, I have to compliment the Holden dealer team. I see Brocky's car looking as good as it ever has all season. Tires will be a worry to them. They can't last this pace. You and they're a little slide, little fishtail, oversteer as we'd call it in technical terms. The more you see the Commodores doing that, will be Glenn Seaton's opportunity to slide into second and then ultimately top position. In non-technical terms, I would call it a sliding sensation because it is miraculous to me the way they manage to keep these cars on the track at the speed they're going. And now we could be in a very interesting situation because the leaders, look, Perkins, Brock and Seaton, 
are closing up on a tail ender and if he gets things wrong there could be a change for first second or third well Perkins is past Brock is past Seaton is passing and is now passed by Decay is closing up on Seaton Dick Johnson in fifth place is getting back and there's Perkins a break. slides in. There's a brake lock up. Uh, there's the first signs. These cars wouldn't be running their full complement of fuel. They can carry 120 litres. No, necess no, no necessity to do that in a short race of only 120 kilometres. Uh, Larry Perkins will be fiddling with his onboard brake boost, which can uh, dial a bit more brake onto the front. And he'll need to do that because, uh, as I recall last year, that's exactly what happened to Alan Grice in a similar position. They are going for broke. Full power on the brakes, too much on the back, locked up and they get a fishtail. Holden horsepower, Alan, what? What horsepower the big Holden's producing? For about 440, 450, Murray. And that'll do nicely. So now, there is Larry Perkins and there's a bit of a gap. And my Dickie is the man to watch because my Dickie is now right up with Glenn Seaton. I think that looked like uh, Johnson sliding through Johnson, there, Murray. Yes, I saw a shell sorry. sign on the bonnet. You're quite right. My apologies. My deck is dropping back. Dick Johnson, who we're used to seeing in the in the famous green Mustang, is now up into fourth position. This is his first season in the Sierra. We are on lap seven. There's still a lot of enjoyment left in this race because it's a 32-lap race. So, Brock second, Seaton third, Dick Johnson right up with the Nissan Skyline in fourth place, and my Dickie dropping back in fifth position. The Dickie's in the pits, Murray, so I think you can say goodbye to his race. It's going to be a challenge now between Johnson and Seaton, and he's already passed him. If he gets into the slipstream of this Commodore, it'll give him an opportunity. He's passed Brock. I don't think, oh, yep, he's done it. Whoa, what well, about kind of that turn. Dick Johnson, number 17, up from fourth position to second position in one lap. Now, he's passed one Holden. He's got a catch and then passed the other one, that of Larry Perkins. I think what Johnson may have been doing was saving his tires originally. You don't just get that kind of squirt uh, by turning on some mysterious automatic pilot. He did a fantastic leap forward in the positions and has now got a commanding position to take on Perkins and challenge for the lead. He may have been nursing his tires, Murray. Well, the gap between Perkins and Johnson is 1.15 seconds only, and we are now on lap 12. Well, there's Andy Mardecki looking very sad as he might well do he was confident of doing well when he was talking to us before the race began and the race is now over for him because even if he rejoins it he's going to be right out of contention what do you reckon is the trouble alan well they're working in the back it could be an electrical fuel problem they're certainly not working on the suspension the bonus up probably just a little bit of heat out of it but the mechanics are definitely at the back where all the fuel pumps are a uh, helmet off doesn't augur too well for getting a quick return into the car it's a savage business, Murray. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Yeah, well, Andy fought for the James Hardy 1000 lead with Steve Soper for a long time and lost it. And now Dick Johnson's going for it. Look at this. Practically sawing the Holden of Larry Perkins in half with his front bumper. And it's now lap eight. Larry Perkins leads on the Holden, but for how much longer is Johnson past the years? Dick Johnson takes the lead. When you can slipstream a car the size of the Commodore, you've got to have the slingshot effect, and we saw that dramatically demonstrated just then. Now, if Johnson plays it cool, he should be able to maintain this position. If his reliability factor comes in, he can certainly drive it. He's not afraid to bounce around these corners. Perkins isn't going to let him get away with it. He's going to stay there as long as he can, but that was an extremely smart move on Dick Johnson's part, sitting back initially, letting the original foray go by, and saving his tires up to the point where he felt, well, these fellas are really going slower than I would like to, so here I am now, I want my shell machine in front. Well, the pride of Queensland has done it. The ATC champion of three years, 81, 82, 84, first at Bathurst in 1981, and look at the way he's going now. He's in a race on his own, and of course, after Wellington, he had troubles that he had to put right before he could even start here, and Brock is in. Peter Brock is in the pits. Car's going up, it'll be tires for sure. No, he's getting out. Overdone it. Oh, well, what a tragedy. That was Peter a furious Brock, pace. That is the last time we have seen Peter Brock 
who has driven so magnificently for Holden through the years in a race for Holden. And that race is over on lap 9 out of 32. Peter Brock, who sensationally came up from 8th on the grid to 2nd on the race, challenging Larry Perkins, who's now dropped back to 2nd place, is out of round 1 of the South Pacific Touring Car Championship race here at Adelaide. It always looks easy when you're out in front, Murray, but he's got a long way to go, and uh, the underbonnet temperatures on a turbo, on particularly a Sierra, reach almost 1,000 degrees centigrade, so there'll be plenty of things cooking under the bonnet of that little Ford. He's got a long way to go to stay in front, but it does look reasonably effortless at the moment. Now, what would you be doing, Alan, in this situation? How much of a cushion would you be wanting to build between yourself and Larry Perkins in second place in the Holden? in order to rest yourself in the car a bit. What he's got is quite sufficient, in fact, he probably a bit more than he really needs, but he can now drive on the gap, his board will tell him as he goes by now, certainly not thrashing the car like that, it's, and there goes... Uh, That's a big one! Wow, we And he's missed everything! Scott. Unbelievable! Unreal. That's Gary Scott in the Starion. I don't think I have ever seen anybody do a teetop cue like that off the course, spin right round, through everyone, and touch nothing. Well, the Formula One fellows have been showing us how to do it. Perhaps he was watching a bit of this morning's qualifying session. He's learned well, because that was absolutely incredible. Meantime, lap 10, we're through quarter distance. Lap 8 was quarter distance. Lap 10 is up to a third distance, and there goes Gary Scott again, out of sight, behind the wall, spins round, misses one two three of them loses it at the front sticks it into gear and away don't do that every day of the week but here we have dick johnson still in the lead quite capable of nursing it to a degree certainly perkins is a threat to him but not one that would be pressing at the moment and i think ford and everybody Alan have done a great job on de development of this Sierra. When it first came out in Britain, it was called the Jelly Mold car, and everybody used to be a bit disparaging about it. But Ford have just worked away at it, got the handling absolutely superb, the power right. The question is, what about the reliability? Well, little things make up big ships, Mary, and race cars are no different. They have to have from bumper bar to bumper bar everything. It doesn't matter what goes wrong. If the car stops, you don't get a performance. And we certainly would love to see Dick Johnson come through today at the uh, last race of the season and uh, do a nice job for himself and his sponsors after a year-long uh, run that has not been his happiest season. Well, one of the men who are troubling him is out because... Seaton has spun and up into third place now has come Alan Grice. But meantime, let's join Daryl Eastlake with Peter Brock in the pits. Peter, not the way you wanted to go out with the old Holden. <laughs> no, no, but it was going well until then. Uh, challenging and uh, Glenn Seaton, unfortunately, uh, hit the front wheel. Had the suspension, no late and damage, but unable to continue, that's why. There is the leader, and meantime, Glenn Seaton has come into the pits directly in front of our commentary position. The Nissan looks as though it's well and truly out of the race. They're pulling away, and the front fenders are getting clear of the wheel. The bonnet is up, Dick Johnson is leading. This is lap 11, and it is time just for a little while to leave Adelaide. Come back to us soon at Adelaide on lap 13. Dick Johnson, there he is in the corner, is leading. Larry Perkins is still in second place. In third place, it's Alan Grice. Fourth is George Fury. Fifth is Colin Bond. Andy Maidecke is back into the race. And there is the Sierra Cosworth. Now, what's happened to Glenn Seaton in the Nissan? That's what happened to Glenn Seaton. Slap, bang, Alakazam into the concrete wall, and that doesn't do the bodywork any good at all. Alakazam, that's a beauty, Murray. Where has he come from? Uh, fabulous. Well, that's very uncharacteristic. Glenn Seaton has had a fabulous season. He very, very seldom puts a foot amiss, but that's on one occasion when it's hurt him, and that wall bites hard. Dick Johnson leads, then. Larry Perkins is still second. Let's have another look at what happened to Glenn Seaton as we go backwards for Christmas and he comes away from the wall. That's what happened to him when he bounced out of contention. He has come into the pits. They've levered away at the front of the car. 
It's a long, hard, tough race here at Adelaide in this Touring Car Championship, round one of the South Pacific Championship. But Dick Johnson still leads, Barry Perkins is still second, about three seconds behind him. Alan Grice third is about the same distance behind Perkins. George Fury is fourth, and Colin Bond in the Turbo Alpha is in fifth place. But without wishing to seem unduly gloomy i wonder if the sierra is going to last the distance because i noticed several times and there you see larry perkins in second place with alan grice closing up on him last year's winner is close on the boot lid of larry perkins holden but to come back to the leader dick johnson i've noticed some telltale puffs of blue smoke from the back of his car is all well the only kind of smoke you want coming out of a turbo is black smoke, Murray, and that doesn't look good. We've only just got by the halfway mark. It's a long way to go for Johnson to hold this race together. Here's Grice coming through, getting onto the boot of Perkins. They'll give him an opportunity to slipstream. I think we're going to have a real fight for second place before this race is over. Yeah, look at this. This is the battle in this race. As they come up now to the Holden of John Farrell, Past goes Larry Perkins. Now that's a good move because he's put, no, it didn't last for very long. I was going to say he's put Farrell between himself and Grice, but not for long because Holden's now second and third behind the Ford Sierra Cosworth RS500 of Dick Johnson. And there's a terrific scrap between these two for second place. And it'll be a scrap to the wire. We've got a tire war going on here. Uh, Perkins runs Dunlops. Grice has pioneered the Yokohama brand for many seasons, and the Yokohama brand has been renowned for hanging on just a little bit longer on occasions, and if Larry is suffering, uh, it's not going to take long for Grice to pounce him in a weak moment. But this will be a few laps to go, I suspect. He's not that close yet. So yep. it is not inconceivable that we could see a two-in-the-row winner for Alan Grice, who won last year. And look at... Look, it certainly seems to me that Larry Perkins is having grip problems with his Dunlop tyres because he certainly slid there and he's more than conscious of the fact that Alan Grice is right behind him. Race order on lap 16, which is half distance. Leading Dick Johnson, he's about eight seconds ahead now. Let's have a look. Yeah, there it is. That's a replay of Larry Perkins nearly losing the Holden in second place. But... Dick Johnson leads, Larry Perkins in second place, Alan Grice in third position, in fourth place now it is George Fury, in fifth position it is Colin Bond and in sixth place it's number six David Parkett Parsons who actually went off the course and has rejoined. Still a scrap here, Grice would be aware of how many laps to go but certainly this is a praying mantis position, I wouldn't like to be in Perkins shoes at the moment but uh, two fine handling Commodores, two fellows that have campaigned these vehicles throughout the season, Murray. Perkins would be one of the lead exponents of the General Motors product and uh, has had probably uh, one of the fastest cars throughout the year. Certainly a very fine run on engine reliability. Neil Burns, his engine engineer, gave us our 24-hour engine for Spa earlier in the year and we were very, very pleased with the performance of that engine for 24 hours. So I don't think Larry's going to be worrying about whether his engine's going to get him through 120 kilometers here today, but he will be worrying about this Bob Jane Grice mobile behind him. What about driver fitness, Alan? Because it's a long, tough race. It's going to be very hot inside those driving compartments. Grice having a look. Both men equally fit, do you think? Yes, there's no question of that. Larry's extremely fit, and as is Alan, uh, you have to be to drive Group A cars. They are fairly difficult to drive this is not an armchair drive contrary to what some people may think that they're just having their normal car around for a couple of laps sunday afternoon drive saturday i should say well meantime these two scrapping for second place are giving paradoxically enough dick johnson an easier time in front because dick is able to choose his line He's got a fairly clear track in front of him. He's got one or two slow men to pass. The gap between them now is 9.7 seconds. There goes Johnson, or rather here comes Johnson, in the shell car with those distinctive logos on the headlight glasses. 
He's doing it nicely, Murray. Nine second gap is a tremendous cushion in a race of this distance. All he has to do is uh, play it cool, save his tires as best he can. He's not having any trouble with his Dunlops, that's for sure. And he's not having any trouble getting through the midfield, man. Just picking his moment. And there's somebody with a major problem. Dennis Hurley in a skyline from Perth. Don't think he's going anywhere. And not in a position that would uh, necessitate the use of the black flag. I think uh, the marshals will just keep the customary yellow there as a precaution, but no need to worry about throwing up the black flag. I thought he parked it very nicely, actually. There he goes. Replace. Almost up alongside the wall, facing the wrong way, in nobody's way. And Dick Johnson continues his victorious march through the field. He is now on lap 18 out of 32. And it would be, I'm sure, a famous victory for Dick and for the Sierra. And look at that! Because that's Perkins and Grice and Grice! That time Grice locked up his brakes and just about took Perkins with him, Murray. That was unbelievable. In fact, I think Perkins saved Gracie from going all the way around. Well, what price Yokohama now, or would you say that nothing would have held the ground? If your brakes are... Whoa, he really slammed on it. I think these fellas are really... They're trying to outbreak each other at the end of the straight. Perkins is going for the doctor to stay in front of Grice, and Grice is trying to outbreak Perkins. In the process, the rear tires are locking up, and really we can't blame the tire for overzealous use of the brake pedal, Murray. And I wouldn't dream of doing so, Alan, but... This is a marvellous demonstration to me of how top racing drivers have to really trust each other. They're on the limits of the machinery and the rubber, and each knows, presumably, that he can trust the other perfectly. Well, two champions at work and two fellows that have raced each other all season, uh, I don't think you're going to see them take themselves out. The action is terrific at Adelaide, and it will be just the same when you rejoin us soon. To coin a phrase, it is action, action, action at Adelaide, and in the corner you see the leader. Dick Johnson is coming through now to complete, and does so, his 20th lap ahead of Larry Perkins, who has got right behind him Alan Grice. In fourth position, it's George Fury, and still in fifth place is Colin Bond. The gap between Dick Johnson, the leader, and Larry Perkins in second place, as you look at Johnson, is 12 seconds. So Johnson is in a very commanding position, and I guess the deciding point at the end is going to be the strength of his Sierra Cosworth engine. Alan, you drove one at Bathurst. How strong is it? The engines themselves, Murray, are extremely strong, and they're not overly stressed. They only rev them to 7,500 RPM, which is not a lot. If people remember my little RX-7, we used to take to 9.5 to 10,000 uh, RPM. Tremendous strains on the engine. I don't think uh, Dick Johnson has got too many worries at the moment watching the way the Commodores are having trouble with their brakes and a little bit of sliding in the corner. But 12 laps as he sits behind that wheel now in his Shell Sierra is going to seem like 12,000 to him. He'll be waiting and hoping that every lap is another one closer to one of his major victories here in Australia this year. But maybe a problem for Dick Johnson that's got nothing to do with the engine. If you look very closely, you can see that the automatic jacking system seems to be about to automatically jack. I hope for his sake it doesn't. Well, if it does, Murray, it'll just rip off. The only danger to him will be that it goes under the car and out the back and not over one of his tires that would put a nice big slice through the middle of it. The other thing that will be a worry, will we have an overzealous Clark, of course, who will haul him in? You yeah, uh, see that bit sticking down? Yep. on the? It's between the right front and right rear wheel. Look underneath Dick Johnson's Sierra as it comes towards you and you'll see the telescopic pillar sticking down it's well clear of the ground, it's no problem, there it is, you see it. Now Dick Johnson is on lap 22 in this 32 lap race. He has a commanding lead of over 12 seconds and it looks as though little can stop him from winning. Although I have said that in the past, only for whoever I was talking about to disappear. Let us hope that that does not happen to Dick Johnson. He has driven absolutely magnificently. He's come from fifth on the grid picked his time, we had the sensational start when Peter Brock went from 8th to 2nd only to retire, but Dick Johnson has driven equally well to come from 5th into the lead, which he has held since the, I'm just checking, 8th, 7th lap. We are now on lap 22, Dick Johnson is in a commanding position, 
he's been there for a long time he will know I guess from pit signals Alan exactly what the score is oh definitely he'll be running on his gap he'll know exactly and plus his rear view mirror he won't be too shy at looking at that on the straight and he'll be feeling comfortable in terms of not being under a great deal of pressure he won't even know that that jack is coming down it's the right rear jack and as it comes down it'll only bounce up again it's going to be a very very strange uh, set of circumstances that really allows it to jackknife out of the car and you saw Peter Brock there taking a very genuine interest and in, there he is leaning on the pit wall not watching the race he would have hoped to win in his last appearance from for Holden before he becomes the boss man of BMW he looks like management material there Murray you know I think you could be convinced that there's a fellow you place your put your money behind I have just a vague suspicion that you're stirring something there Alan so I better avoid that one I'm looking forward to racing him again next year great well, here's someone else you'll be up against. There is Dick Johnson as we watch Alan Price go through. And the gap is increasing, if anything. Perkins second, Price is third. But you can see now that Alan, that Larry Perkins has extended his lead. Here he comes. There's the big Casio Holden of Larry Perkins, ex Grand Prix driver, in second place and it looks as though he is shaking off Alan Grice. He's definitely held off that challenge very nicely, Murray, and I would say he's in a position now with the uh, only nine laps to go that he possibly can do that. If it was tires that was uh, fighting and holding the, the, the war at bay, then his Dunlops have done him well. But I'd like to also comment on the fact that you're looking at one of the best handling Commodores in Australia, and as such, in a long race, on a hot day, when tires become a factor when they don't want to do their jobs as well as they should then if your engineering is built into your car you can still come through and hold the day is that special handling Alan, due to special bits or special skill in setting the car up it's in the driver's skill and the ability to know how to get the spring rates on your old car your whole shock absorber package your brake package and in fact the weight of the car from front to rear has a very very critical fact well, Larry Perkins has clearly done a super job. This is lap 23, and the race order is still Dick Johnson leading, Larry Perkins that you're looking at in second place, pulling away from Alan Price in third position. In fourth place now, it's still George Fury, 42-year-old George Fury in the Nissan Skyline. In fifth position, it is Glenn Seaton. No, it's not. I'm sorry, it's Colin Bond, of course. Glenn Seaton disappeared. Colin Bond in fifth position in the Alfa Romeo. And sixth is still David Parsons, ahead of, in seventh place, Tony Kavich. And there we go. There are the numbers. Those numbers, incidentally, along the bottom of the screen, show number 17, Dick Johnson, in the lead. And there is Grice in third place. This car had a savage run in New Zealand a fortnight ago, Murray. They had trouble in New Zealand and uh, took a fairly savage clout into the wall over there. And with a shipping stripe on the way back, I know Les Small and the fellows that prepare this car didn't have the two or three days that they really would have liked to have had to get this car into top shape because this is not running at the pace that Grice had this vehicle doing a year ago today. Well, they've done a mag magnificent external job on it, uh, Alan. You'd never know it had been involved in any problems. Everything ship shape. Alan Grice down behind the wheel. Now we are on lap 24. There's not long to go on this 32-lap race, and you'll be back with us to see that. Lap 26 now as you rejoin us. No change in the first five. Dick Johnson still way out there in front. Larry Perkins second in the Holden. Alan Grice in third position. George Fury in the Nissan Skyline is fourth. But I tell you what I find interesting, Alan Moffat, and that is that Colin Bond is in fifth place in the Alfa Romeo because we don't, to be quite honest, in Europe associate the Alpha 75T turbocharged car with a great deal of success. He seems to be going extremely well. Oh, he's worked very hard on his uh, Caltex car, Murray. They've run it all season. He's taken the best he can from Europe. Uh, they didn't have extremely good luck at Bathurst, but it's nice to see Colin out here with a finish today in the last race of the season, and uh, credit to his team. Well, there is the Alpha crew in the pit lane looking pretty relaxed and phlegmatic about it all, I must say. 
but out in front still it's Dick Johnson number 17 there he is the car looking spick and span now it's a lonely job out in front but there is Colin Bond's car the one that we were just talking about the Alfa Romeo very very distinctive lines with the high rising rear which is designed that way in order to assist the slipperiness of the car the penetration and Colin Bond of course very very much the veteran Australian touring car champion as long ago as 1975 prior to which he'd had a string of rally successes and prior to even that he won Bathurst in 1969 indeed I think I'm right in saying he's won just about every long distance race in Australia that it's possible to win a very accomplished driver and a very friendly fellow and a, a gentleman and a credit to the sport and there he goes the leader now on lap 27 a lonely job out front Alan is he is there any danger of Dick Johnson losing concentration no because he'll be hearing every sound in Australia at the moment everything that is rattling on that Sierra he'll be hearing he'll have his toes crossed his fingers crossed the smoke is starting to uh, permeate up the back of the car again and I know one thing he'll have his eyes glued to that tackle Murray he won't be taking it one ounce over 7,000 rpm he'll be watching for his oil pressure he'll be checking the turbo temperature he'll be gluing his eyes every five seconds to the rear view mirror making sure that he's still in safe place and most importantly when he goes by his pits checking how many laps have I got to keep going well he's got five laps to go at the end of this one five long lonely laps Dick Johnson now you look down the straight Johnson out on his own if he wins and he's going to win if he stays where he is now how much is it going to mean to him having won at Adelaide a tremendous amount because taking a leaf uh, from Larry Perkins comments it is very very nice to be associated with the Foster's Australian Grand Prix not every race we've got has such tremendous atmosphere nothing has the atmosphere that we see here today in Adelaide short of Bathurst and it's a tremendous thrill for these fellows to be participants in a great event like the Australian Grand Prix well, it's a wonderful advertisement for Australian organisation, administration, presentation and enthusiasm because there is an enormous crowd in the grandstand here watching now Alan Grice and there in front of him, Dick Johnson is now on his 28th lap. So there are five laps including the one he's on. He has commanded this race from the seventh lap and this is lap 28 and even I can work out that that is 21 laps in the lead and that is a long, long time. And I think he got there, Murray, by virtue of the fact that he was prepared to throttle himself a degree in the opening laps. And even though that smoke's getting bad now from our point of view, I think it can go five laps at that pace. It's certainly not licking up all over the car and there's not a lot of smoke coming out the exhaust pipe. That looks more like an overrun leak, perhaps a gearbox leak on the downshift that's throwing oil up a bit and getting on the exhaust pipe, but it doesn't seem to be an engine problem as such. That's the upside. I must say on the downside, it sounded a bit rough to me as he went past our commentary position on the previous lap. Coming through to complete his 29th lap in this 32-lap race. Time for you to leave us for a short while. Be back soon. Lap 29, Dick Johnson leads, but... I, wa I don't want to be an alarmist, I want you to make your own judgment. Larry Perkins is second, Grice is third, Fury is fourth, and Bond is fifth. But is Johnson in trouble? Listen to your, for yourselves to the engine of his Ford Sierra Cosworth. Still pulling out cleanly, Murray. He's, not, uh, he's certainly not revving it. He's letting the turbo take care of itself on the straights. He's not giving it a big squirt by any stretch of the imagination. Well, it, this is lap 30 in this 32-lap race, and we now need to get a stopwatch on Dick Johnson in the lead with a puff of smoke, blue smoke coming from the back of his car as he throttles down and see what the gap is between himself and Larry Perkins, who is second, followed by Grice in third position. Fury is in fourth place. Colin Bond is still fifth. No change there and Dick Johnson coming up to that tail end and to pass him cleanly and swiftly so there's certainly no problem on the straight.
Well, they blew a gearbox up in this car yesterday, and that was one of the reasons why Dick didn't get as good a qualifying time as he probably could have, fifth place on the grid. And uh, let's just hope that uh, this isn't a uh, weak gearbox coming to the forefront again to uh, plague him on the very last lap. Well, the gap last time we took it was 12 seconds between Dick Johnson in the lead and Larry Perkins in second place. Larry Perkins seems to have dropped back a bit. There is Grice. Now, where is Dick Johnson on the circuit? There is Grice anyway, and he's got George Fury right up behind him. It looks as though we are going to have a grandstand finish. This is coming up to the end of lap 30. Dick Johnson across the line now. Grice spins out. It is all happening in the closing stages. Look at that. Now, what is the gap? I'm looking for Larry Perkins because the leader, Dick Johnson, has gone through. There is Perkins going very slowly indeed, 16 seconds. So, Dick Johnson is definitely going a bit slower, but Larry Perkins has slowed right up. Grice has spun off. Fury is now into second place. The, the tires have given up on them, Murray. That's, that's what happens. Yep. Absolutely. Alan Grice displaying that top racing driver's coolness, looking to the left, looking to the right as he spins off. But now, on lap 31 out of 32, whilst Dick Johnson is leading in the Ford Sierra Cosworth, which is a little bit sick, but not sick enough to worry him, I hope. Up into second place in the Nissan Skyline, two-litre turbocharged car comes George Fury. Down to third place goes Larry Perkins. In fourth place behind Perkins now, it is Colin Bond. Up into fifth position comes David Parsons. Well, that's a nice finish for George Fury to go out at the end of the season. That's all the last run for this car that it'll ever have. They're going to a, a new car next year, a six-cylinder version of the Skyline. And uh, awfully nice to get a place if you can't win. Second's pretty darn good in this business. There is George Fury, number 30. Third in the 1987 Australian Touring Car Championship. Winner of five out of ten rounds in 1986. Fifth in the James Hardy Thousand this year. And he was fourth at Wellington, the New Zealand race. And here is Dick Johnson starting his last lap, his 32nd and last lap. As I said earlier on, from lap seven where he took the lead, he's commanded the race. The gap between himself and George Fury, though, he's down to seven seconds. This is amazing. Uh, Johnson is uh, squirting from side to side on the track, Murray, if he's got a fuel pickup problem. That's the normal telltale. We could see George Fury win this race on the last lap. That would be tragic for number 17, race leader Dick Johnson. Listen to his engine. It's not running on all five, all four, all three, or even all two. Now, look. Hey, look for the design in the background. You saw it. And as Dick Johnson comes up to stag turn to go down Rundle Road and then to Ketterville Terrace, I think he's going to lose the race. If Fury can come there through there Fury. on full pace, he's going to get a slipstream with his car in front of them. It's, it's on the cards. It's going to be fantastically close because Fury now is about four seconds, if that, behind him. George Fury, there is the gap. It's visual. This is the last lap, last lap here of this fantastically exciting race which Larry Perkins did so well in, Peter Brock did so well in, Dick Johnson has done so well in. He's in the closing stages, he is in dire trouble. He's going to have a heck of a job to stave off George Fury, but he's looking cool, calm and he's connected. He's definitely out of fuel, Murray. He's, he's swaying from side to side, trying to get the pickup, the swirl in the tank. They have a reserve oh, tank, but no. Last corner coming up. You can see the gap. George Fury is gaining hand over fist. Dick Johnson's going to be caught on the line. Is he? No, he's not. He, he might just make he it. He wins. Dick Johnson wins from George Fury by 1.96 in a fantastic finish. And a well-deserved win. And Larry Perkins staggers home in third place ahead of Alan Grice for well so now in fifth position it is colin bond and 
and in sixth place it is David Parsons. Well, let's just recap on that fantastic race as you see Nick Johnson and George Fury driving round together, both taking the cheers of the crowd, which they both richly deserve, but especially Dick Johnson, because he managed to nurse that car home. Victory for Dick Johnson in the Ford Sierra Cosmo. Second place for George Fury in the Nissan Skyline. In third position, Larry Perkins in the Holden Commodore. Ahead of Alan Grice, fourth in another Commodore. Fifth was Colin Bond in the Alfa Romeo. And in sixth position, David Parsons. So how about that? A great credit to see uh, Dick Johnson has persevered with his car all season. It's not easy, as I mentioned earlier, if it was, everybody would be in the business to go out with a win, last race of the season, something that you can put under the Christmas tree and uh, nurture for all your worries in, in 1988. That's got to be a lift for him and his team that have done a hard, hard year's season. Yes, well, tomorrow the Grand Prix, today the South Pacific Touring Car Championship, and uh, we're going to have a job to have a Grand Prix tomorrow, but turns out to be as exciting in the last stages as that touring car race. Dick Johnson deserved his victory. Group A racing is alive and well in the South Pacific, Murray. You might tell that to your friends in France when you're over there. I know you're very big in France. <laughs> well, I think we're all conscious of that because Australia is the place we look to for touring car racing. You develop these cars so magnificently. We know how well they go. It was tremendously interesting and exciting for all of us to have you and your compatriots over last year taking part in the European Championship Series. And uh, we desperately want to see you all over there as much as possible. The trouble is, of course, that whilst Group A racing may be in good health in Australia, it doesn't seem to be in very good health elsewhere in the world for next year anyway. Oh, well, with the development of the silhouette formula that our Formula One leaders have uh, foisted upon us, uh, we're going to have to uh, hold the, uh, the standard in this part of the world, and I'm sure watching races like we've just seen is an indication that we can do that. Wow, what a race that was. And wasn't it great to hear Alan Moffat and Murray Walker? What a combo that was. And, I mean, just one more lap, and uh, it could have been uh, George Fury, the winner of the South Pacific Touring Car Championship round one with no round two for that year. All I wanted to say is that it reminded me of the tyre wars and, and how tyre wars can make uh, uh, a race so much more interesting, unlike today where you have one brand and, say, Formula One, that sort of thing. Thanks for watching. Super 100 MPH, and please subscribe. Wow.